service this morning. It's lovely to see you all here on this Pentecost Sunday as we think about the power and the presence of God in our midst and in our lives this morning. Let's settle our hearts together as we come together as the people of God. Lord, we come before you as your people and we pray that you would bless us and enfold us and fill us with your spirit this morning. That we may worship you in spirit and in truth. That we may receive you into our lives. That we may know you as you know us. And with all that we bring before you that we carry in our lives and our hearts, we pray for your blessing. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus be with you. Let's listen to our first hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all people. Almighty God. Our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all of our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. 
Almighty God, who forgive us all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep us all in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Would you please stand as we say the glory, pray the glory together. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. <coughs> Holy Spirit, sent by the Father, ignite in us your holy fire. Strengthen your children with the gift of faith. Revive your church with the breath of your love and renew the face of the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Would you please be seated for our life? Bible reading is taken from Acts, chapter 2, Verses 1 to 21. The Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, the crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then, how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own language tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, They've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews, all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in these days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. 
and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord. The work of the Holy Spirit. When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. I have told you this, so that when their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. I did not tell you this from the beginning, because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me. None of you asks me, where are you going? Rather, you're filled with grief because I have said these things. But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. And about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own, he will only speak what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me, because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you. To you. In a moment we're going to listen to a hymn, Jesus is King, but before we do that I'm going to read Bands of Marriage. Between, I published the Bands of Marriage between Alan Curry and William Duckworth between Christopher Peter Tollington Leverick and Victoria Elizabeth Stoner, and between Zoe Tatterall and Tony Marshall. These are for the first time of asking and for the third time of asking. If anybody knows any reason why these persons may not lawfully marry, you must declare it now. Please see me. Lord, as these couples prepare for their wedding day, we pray for your blessing upon them, your love to fill them and guide them and lead them, that you would watch over them in all their preparations and draw them ever closer to you and to one another. In Jesus' name, Amen. Now we're going to listen to our next hymn, Jesus is King.
that tune in the kitchen later as you're preparing lunch. Lord, in the hearing of your word, we pray for your blessing that you would open our eyes and our ears to hear you, to receive you deep within, to know you and your love for us. In your precious name we pray. Amen. One of the most popular comedians of recent times, who's gone to ground a bit recently, was Peter Kay. Simple, observational humour that is just very, very funny. And one of his catchphrases was, what's that all about? He'd set up a scene, describe a behaviour, and then ask the question, what's that all about? It's a super catchphrase because it captures something in your mind and it plays in your mind, much like a tune, over and over again. And it's the essential question about the situation. It's actually the essential question about the whole of life. From life, death, the universe and everything to our everyday situations, we all ask, what's that all about? What is going on? What does it mean? It's a very simple question about what it means what we do here today as God's people. What does this mean is the response in the book of Acts. What is that all about? What is going on? How many people ask you that question about why you're coming out of church? Or going in? And would the response ever be, have you seen them all in that church? They must be drunk. Except the picker. So, I mean, could that ever be asked of you and I in response to what we're doing? Is there ever that moment of craziness? Or is it all very well ordered and sedate and English and angry? What was going on on the day of Pentecost? What was happening? And does it still happen? That's the question. And people often think they know what church is about. But perhaps they're not sure what faith is about. Of who Jesus is, and increasingly less so in our society more than ever before. And that's a good thing because it takes us right back into the heart of Pentecost. It takes us right back to the first century when we the church and people did not know what Jesus was about fully and they had to get up and get out and tell others so the church answers the question what is that all about but there is indeed a problem you see we don't see people asking the question as much as we like and when they do sometimes we find it hard to answer so how do we get around this problem Good advertising creates a need, something you hadn't thought of before. That's why there's how many soaps, if you just think about how many soaps there are. Soap does one thing, but this soap will do these things. This soap will wash you cleaner than anything else and your car, or whatever. Good advertising creates a need, finds a niche, and exploits it. It's a, but Christianity, our faith, what we do as a church, does not do that. It does not create a need. It uncovers the need that is inside every single human being at the deepest level to find out the answer to the question, what is that? What is life all about? It addresses the big issues and the small issues and it answers them fully. But that's not all. Our faith is a life-giving, life-affirming, life-loving experience of the power of God, the presences of God, the presence of God and the purposes of God for us in all things. That's the answer to the question. A life-affirming, life-loving experience of the power of God, the presence of God and the purpose of God in all things for all things, for all time, in Christ Jesus. Which is why the Puritans would write that theology, that is, understanding the Bible, is the science of living blessedly forever. A science 
of being happy without end. That's what we do. That's the answer to the question. It's no less than that. That's what Pentecost is about. So when they say, what is going on? What is that all about? That's the answer. Do you want to be happy forever? And not just for a moment. You see, the coming of the Spirit on the church is not for you and me. It's not our personal possession. It's not even for our own sense of satisfaction. But it's for proclamation and empowerment power that others may see and hear the Saviour. Now then, we're going to come to the communion and you're going to repeat the words that you say every time you have communion. The Lord is here. His Spirit is with us. And everything I've just said is encapsulated in that prayer. Communion is not for you and for me, it's for proclamation. That the Lord indeed is here. They answer the question, where is God? He is here. And we are called to keep in step with the Spirit every day, in every way. To be filled with the Spirit, to walk in the Spirit, not to grieve the Spirit, nor quench the Spirit. We are called to live so closely in the power of the Spirit every day that we never lose touch with His presence in our lives, the power of His love in our hearts, and His leading in all that we do or say. Now it's easy to say all. That's what we're called to. And you and I will know we have had moments of that. But we're always called back to that. Which is why Pentecost is a day of examination. You see, on the day of Pentecost, faith went from being an external reality to the rules and the rituals of Judaism into a personal reality of the presence and power of God in his spirit in the proclamation of Jesus. And so the examination is simply this. Are you, if you like, on the outside, still sitting in the rules and the regulations? Or do you know this from the present, in the moment, in the power of the Spirit, internally, so that you are renewed and revived and refreshed and restored by the Holy Spirit until that day when the Lord Jesus comes again in power, as that reading in Acts said, and changes all things? Because what's supposed to happen each Sunday is you and I have a foretaste of what will happen one day. So how do we know this? How do we get a, a glimpse and a grasp of this? By going back to our gospel reading with the Holy Spirit, Jesus says, I've got to clear off. I'm sending you the counsellor, the helper, the comforter, the one who will come alongside and help. He brings comfort. Now what does that mean? Well, I was in prison a few years back <coughs> on a visit honest. And one of the things the chaplain told me, that, uh, that the medical service was dire. An inspection report had slated them for their unprofessionalism and their, quote, very poor bedside manner. The Holy Spirit is the epitome of the bedside manner. Who he is as the third person of the Trinity, his whole personality is to get near you, under your skin, and comfort you. Now what this means is, the word for comfort does not mean, as anyone who's been to a nurse, a doctor, a hospital, or whatever else, does not always mean saying, they're there, how you think about it is the right way, and I hope you get better soon and it'll be very nice. Sometimes it's you need this and this and you have to do this. The comfort is not only gentle and warm, but it can be a firm, rousing kick in the pants. That's what happened at Pentecost. But nevertheless, he is there to strengthen the weak and mobilize the strong. He is the counselor and comforter. And just when we need him, he will be there. Have you ever called out on God for his spirit to bring you his strength 
when you need it. Because we need a God who can draw alongside and help us at our point of need. Which is why Jesus mentions that the Spirit here is right there because the disciples are going to face a time of trial. I am going away. You will look for me. You don't, don't even ask where I'm going. At that point, at that moment, you will need something. So let's go back to the holy huddle in Pentecost, in that upper room. And suddenly they're all taken over by an experience. They are filled with power and they are praying and saying and speaking in other tongues so that nations will hear the proclamation. Indeed, they are making a holy nuisance of themselves. For them, the penny had dropped with a very loud clang. And for us, this may need to happen. And it needs to happen daily. But for others, it may need to happen in a much more gentle, measured, quiet way. But the one thing that is common about all this experience is it is the personal experience of Jesus. He will come, says Jesus, to convict. Now this is not like a judge convicting to take you out, to be hanged. This is the conviction that all that we think about life is not necessarily true. All that we want in our way is not necessarily true. But actually, his way is better. His way is loving. His way is caring. And all the things that Jesus taught and said and did, it says, he will remind you. The Holy Spirit will not let Jesus be forgotten. So how does this work out? I want you to pray for this for yourselves. For one another. For our church. That we may grow deeper. More united. More passionate and more powerful in the presence of God. And in that way, people will ask a question. Have you seen that church? What is going on? And they will ask that about the church because they'll ask that about you and say, what is it you have in your life that I don't? Do you know this? Do you know Jesus? Do you know his spirit? Do you know his power and his presence and his peace? And as you enter into this week, will the words that we say at communion be real? The Lord is here. Or will they be ritual? The Lord was here. Serious question. So this Pentecost, will you open your heart and mind and life and love to the power, the presence and the conviction of the Holy Spirit, who will come alongside, who will give you his blessing, who will give you his peace, I want you now, as I'm going to move into a moment of prayer, to think about something this week in your mind's eye. And move into that in your mind. And think, how may the Holy Spirit be there in that moment? Lord, we pray that you will open us up increasingly to the power and the presence of your love. Holy Spirit of God, come amongst us and upon us. Renew us and revive us. Restore us, redeem us, reignite your love for us. Work a miracle in our lives today. That we may ask, what was that all about? And know the answer you give. 
Now we're going to listen to the song, Holy Spirit, we welcome. God, our Heavenly Father, you promised through your Son, Jesus Christ, to hear us when we pray in faith. 
On this day of Pentecost, we pray that your Holy Spirit may dwell among us and burn up our fears in the heat of your love and fill our minds with the joyous freedom of your spirit. Make our church a place of love and joy. Lord, in your mercy, we, are all right. we pray for our Queen and the royal family, especially this week with all the media news. We pray for all in authority. May they be granted wisdom and understanding. We pray for Bishop Mark and all clergy, including Ron and the ministry team. And we pray for all who live and worship in the united benefits of Norley, Croton, Kingsley, and here in Alvinley and Manley. May we, as time goes by, make many new friends throughout our villages. We thank you, Lord, that the coronavirus pandemic is subsiding in our country, and we are now able to meet more freely with our friends and relatives. We pray for the people all around the world who are still suffering from this virus. And we thank you for the scientists' expertise and pray for the fair distribution of the vaccine throughout the world to eradicate this pandemic. We pray for all people in war-torn countries, thinking especially of the Israeli and Palestinian conflict and the ceasefire now in place. Merciful Lord, we pray for peace throughout the world. <coughs> Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. <coughs> we pray for our school children, students, and all in education, especially those who are taking vital exams at this time. We pray for our teachers who are under extra pressure to keep everyone safe. We pray for those who are ill, those in hospital, and those known to us personally. Also for those who have died recently, including Mrs. Pat Storr, whose funeral was held here last Thursday, and also the family of John Britland. and also those whose anniversary of death comes at this time. Heavenly Father, surround those who mourn with your continuing compassion. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. a prayer for this week. Living God, thank you for the energy of Pentecost for the promises fulfilled, for the lives changed, for the hearts touched, for the power unleashed, for the overflowing of your spirit into our world. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We look forward to the coming week with the signs of spring all around us. We thank you, Lord, that we live in such a wonderful part of the country where we can enjoy such beauty. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Christ is our peace. He has reconciled us to God in one body by the cross. We meet in his name and we share his peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let's offer one another a way of peace. <laughs> Christ to be our Saviour. His dying and rising have set us free from sin and death. And so we gladly thank you with saints and angels praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. We praise and bless you, loving Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And as we obey his command. Send your Holy Spirit, the broken bread and wine outpour may be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. On the night before he died, he had supper with his friends, and taking bread, he praised you. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he took a cup of wine again. He praised you and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. So, Father, remember all that Jesus did, in him we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross. Bringing before you the bread of life and the cup of salvation, we proclaim his death and resurrection till he comes in glory. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Lord of all life, help us to work together for that day when your kingdom comes and justice and mercy will be seen in all the earth. Look with favour on your people, gather us in your loving arms, and bring us with all the saints to feast at your table in heaven, through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honour and glory are yours, O loving Father, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, who 
whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. Draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you. And feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving.
faithful God, who fulfill the promises of Easter by sending us your Holy Spirit and opening to every race and nation the way to eternal life. Open our lips by your Spirit, that every tongue may tell of your glory, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Pray the prayer after communion. I want us to think as we pray about the last clause, about being sent out in the power of the Spirit. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. We're going to listen to a song in a moment. You shall go out with joy. That's not a dating agency. <laughs> That's the spirit and the joy of God in our lives. For those who remember, may still use the Book of Common Prayer. It's a great line there that I wish I'd have kept in the modern service. Uh, offer our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. In the Book of Common Prayer it says a lively sacrifice. It has a completely different ring to it, doesn't it? Lively. Let's be lively as we leave today and enter into this week. Filled with the power and the presence of God. And to that end we're going to listen to you shall go out with joy. Go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.